Welcome to Crossroads Online. My name is Rachel, one of the pastors here, and I'm so glad you're worshiping with us today. Before we get started, we'd love for you to take a moment to share this service with a friend or family member. Just send them a link or share the video on Facebook. We would love to hear from you, and the best way to do that is to fill out a communicator card on our Crossroads app. Let us know you're here and how we can be praying for you this week. Let's begin our time together with worship.
If you're new or relatively new to Crossroads, I want to invite you to an informal Zoom call that we call Next Step. It's this Wednesday, March 10th at 6.30 p.m. You can learn more about Crossroads, meet some of our staff, as well as learn how to get connected and take the next step in your spiritual journey. Register online on the app or at xr.church slash next step. Another way to take a step in your walk with Christ is through our online Following Jesus class starting Monday, March 22nd. Following Jesus is the core class of Crossroads where you will learn how to pray, worship, understand the Bible, deal with temptation, put Jesus first, and share your faith. At the end of the class, becoming a member of Crossroads Church is optional. Sign up on the app or at xr.church fj. Focus is back for 2021. Focus is a two-day event for students to volunteer and help our neighbors. On April 24th and 25th, teens ages 5th through 12th grade will serve in their community in a small work crew with others around their age. Students will get to have a lot of fun with their friends and adult leaders making memories and making a difference. Get more details and register at xrstudents.org. Hello, my name is Amber Harkle Road. My husband, Christopher, and I joined Crossroads um, in what was Thanksgiving, I think, of 2016. It was right before we got married. We got married in June of 2017. Um, right after we got married, Chris and I decided that we wanted to start a family. And July of that year, we found out um, some unfortunate news that I had cancerous cells um, that needed to be removed. Um, it was a big shock to me. I was scared, uh, feeling like our plans of having a family just weren't in the cards for us. Um, earlier that summer, um, I actually signed up for the encounter retreat that was going to be held in August. Um, so with this burden kind of weighing heavy on my heart, just finding out two weeks before the encounter retreat, um, I didn't really want to go. It was just wasn't really in the mood to be around other people, but I ended up going. I was, you know, scared, just finding every reason not to go. I ended up arriving, uh, got put in a group of other females while I was there, and a lot of them had some similar situations that uh, I had, and so it made it really easy and comfortable for me to talk about what was going on in my life and um, also very easy to to pray about it um, also about the upcoming surgery that I was going to have to do in September of 2017. Um, it was the end of the second day of the retreat and a lot of the leaders um, came up to me and asked if they could pray for me. Uh, we went into a room and they all circled around me, laid their hands on me, uh, laid their hands on my shoulders and and just prayed. Um, it was such a strong sense of the Holy Spirit in that room. It was the strongest I've ever felt. Um, these people, some of them pray, prayed in tongues, others, you know, whatever was drawn, like they heard God speaking to them. I left there just with a new hope, this fire that was like in my soul for God. Um, I knew that he was going to answer my prayer. I went through the surgery um, just fine uh, September of that year, healed very quickly. Uh, my husband and I, we uh, spent the next two years trying to conceive. Um, meanwhile, we decided to just embrace being newlyweds, we traveled a lot. Um, and, you know, closer to that two year mark, just thought that it was never gonna happen. You know, continued to pray, uh, continued to go to church, continued to talk to others about it. And uh, we were on vacation in Mexico um, in May of 2019, when we got the best news ever. Uh, we were gonna be expecting our first uh, child, uh, Anna. Um, she was born in January of 2020, and she's beautiful, healthy, just absolutely wonderful. It's an answer to prayer. Um, so God does answer prayers. He, you know, it's not always with, I mean, in our plan, in our timeline, but it's God's plan, and it will happen when 
he has when it's ready for him. Um, Anna is now 13 months old and we are also expecting our second child. Our son is due in April of this year. So God is good and God answers prayer. Your generosity is what fuels our mission to make disciples who make disciples. The easiest way to give is online at xr.church give, or you can mail a check to the address on your screen. Before we give, let's pray together. Join me in praying. Father, as we receive today's offering, we are believing you for understanding and wisdom, courage and discernment, insight and revelation, open doors, favor and breakthrough. We pray that you would lift us up above every obstacle, doubt, and fear. We thank you, Lord, for meeting our needs. We trust in you and pray that you would multiply our gifts for the sake of your kingdom. Amen. Let's continue to worship God together through singing and giving.
wanna take some time and pray for you. I feel like the Spirit is speaking to me about maybe some struggles that some of you are going through and I just want to pray for you. One struggle that I feel like God is saying is that some of you or someone that is listening today was really vulnerable and really just shared something that a struggle or a, a sin and you shared it with someone maybe you've known for a long time but they didn't provide the support that you were looking for and you're feeling discouraged. And so I just wanna pray for you right now. God, I lift up the vulnerable one the one who took a chance and risked it all, Father God, and uh, just shared a struggle, God. I pray right now you meet them right where they're at, Father, that you would provide them comfort and encouragement. And God, I pray that you just um, strengthen them to share again and that you would provide a person who's ready to receive and listen to their struggles, to provide that support that love and the grace that is so needed. Father God, I lift this person up to you in Jesus' name. I also sense that um, there might be someone who's struggling, maybe recovering from a surgery or an illness, and the recovery is long and it's hard and it's not going as expected. And I feel like I just wanna pray for you and your healing. God, thank you for bringing to mind this individual, God, this individual who's going through a tough time. Father God, Lord, recovery is hard. And um, God, I just pray that you restore hope as you restore healing in this person. Father God, I pray for healing. I pray for the Holy Spirit to just heal from the top of the head to the tip of their toes. Father, anything that is not right, anything that is inflamed, anything that is stiff, Father God, we just pray for your healing, miraculous healing for your glory and God as you heal physically I pray you heal emotionally too that you would restore that hope that they would um, take each day with gratitude and um, God that they would just move and be drawn closer to you as they heal God loves to speak to each one of us through our time of prayer. And so now I just wanna pray for you that you would have ears to hear how he's calling you to pray for those around you. Father, I pray for spiritual hearing to be opened, God. Lord, as believers, we are called to have the compassion of Christ for those around us, believers and non-believers. And so God, teach us how to pray for those that you are calling us to who are in our sphere of influence, Father God. Give us words of knowledge, give us prophecy, and let us be bold and share them freely in the name of Jesus, amen. If you would like prayer today or you feel like we were praying for you, we would love for you to message us on Facebook or go on to xr.church and live chat us. Prayer partners are waiting to pray with you. Great to be with you today. My name is Jonathan Cordell, and it's hard to imagine that this week is going to hit the one year mark of living with COVID in Pittsburgh. And a lot of that impact has uh, been difficult and challenging in my life. But one of the nice things is that I've saved a ton of money on gas this past year. I rarely need to fill up my tank, but eventually I do, and so I'll go generally find a get-go, because somehow Giant Eagle has convinced me that unless I use my Advantage card, then I'm being ripped off when I go somewhere else. So I'll flip open my gas flap, and then I read the words, regular unleaded only. So this is telling me that my car can only run on regular unleaded gasoline. That's the fuel that it needs to go. I can put other stuff in there, but it's not gonna work. If I try to put orange juice in my gas tank, it's not gonna get very far. Like coffee, it has caffeine maybe, so I'll try that out. It, it's still not gonna work out. So in order for my car to get somewhere, 
it needs the right kind of fuel. In Made for More, we've been reading through Ephesians 1 and 2 that we're created by God as his masterpieces, and he's created each of us for a specific calling. And this calling flows from our purpose, which is to live life with God. And then when we're saved by Jesus, God the Father adopts us into his family. So once this happens, you could say that God gets us involved in the family business of renewing the world and bringing heaven to earth. And he gives each of us a unique calling in order to accomplish that. So Paul, the writer of Ephesians, knows that in order to live into this kind of calling, you're going to need the right kind of fuel. So in chapter 3, he prays for us to be faithful filled with God's love. If we want to do what God's calling us to do, we need to be filled by God's love. So that's exactly what Paul prays for. Ephesians 3, 16 through 19, he says, I pray that from his glorious unlimited resources, he will empower you with inner strength through his spirit. Then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust in him. Your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. And may you have the power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, and how deep his love is. May you experience the love of Christ, though it's too great to understand fully. Then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. So think about that. In Ephesians 2, Paul is telling us about our calling. Like we each have a role to play in bringing God's kingdom. And then he prays for us to be filled with God's love. So his go-to move to help us pursue our calling is for us to be filled with more of God's love. And I'll confess, as a pastor, when I think about mission, I go straight to action steps. Like, let's get a strategic planning meeting together and then execute the steps. But that's not Paul's move. Instead, he prays for God's love to fill the church. He knows if we don't have God's love, nothing else will matter. So our calling depends on being filled with God's love ourselves. In other words, God wants his love to fill us until it overflows to the life around us. Paul caps off this prayer with a doxology, uh, praising God. Verse 20, he says, Now all glory to God, who is able through his mighty power at work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. Glory to him and the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations forever and ever. So when God's family is filled with more of his love and power, it'll accomplish more than we might ask or think. I'd love to see that happen. And so here's how it does. When we think of being filled with God's love, We need to remember that God's full is different from our full. Like my level of full generally means that I am filled. So God's love goes beyond that. Take this glass. When I fill it with water, I'd say it's full whenever it's near to the brim. So naturally, when I think of God's love filling me, I think that it generally means filling me until I'm full. But Ephesians 3.19 says the love of Christ is too great to understand fully. So God is, his love is going to max me out and then some. So God's version of full means that I'm filled to the point of overflowing. So look, like God's love, it's splattering everywhere now. So if you haven't been filled until God's love is spilling and overflowing to those around you, my friend, you are not filled yet. It's also important to know what we're talking about when we talk about love, because love is a word that we bring a lot of baggage to. Some ways we've learned to think of love might lack the kind of fulfilling love that God wants to give us. They're shallow. So if I ask someone to fill my glass with water (laughs) and they only put a little bit in, I'm going to ask them to keep filling it. It's too shallow. I need more. 
Similarly, at times, we experience shallow loves that leave us wanting more. One of those is how you feel. You know, when I was in first grade, I experienced my very first crush. Her name was Taylor. She was a redheaded heartbreaker at six years young, and she had all the right qualities I was looking for in a significant other. She had great taste in toys. She was funny. She hardly ever wet her pants like I did, and those are the things that mattered to me in first grade. She made me get the butterflies when I was around her. Like I thought about her when I was at home. I secretly wrote notes that I never gave to her. So in my six-year-old mind, I was in love. But eventually my family moved and I kind of moved on with my life. I didn't really think about her ever again. My ship had sailed and that's because my love was a fleeting, shallow kind of love. The warm fuzzies of a crush isn't enough to sustain a relationship for the long term. Just ask any couple who's had a healthy marriage after 50 years. When the feelings wear out, the relationship needs to be built on a stronger foundation in order to last. So it's great to sense God's love with our emotions, but it goes way beyond that. We don't wanna just come to God like an addict trying to get the next fix of an emotional high. Now, I'm a naturally emotional person, so I often feel God that way, and I'm not discrediting that, but if you're in a season where you don't have that or you don't operate that way, don't feel like there's something wrong with you. Holy Spirit is doing a greater work in you than just overwhelming your feelings. Our love for others can't depend on our feelings either, so sometimes we might not feel like serving others in love or logging on to Zoom to meet with our life group. But when we take these steps, God makes us more like Jesus. So feeling love is wonderful, but it's a lot bigger than that. Another shallow love that leaves me wanting more is those who are like me. You know, when we surround ourselves with people who look, think, and just hold the same interests that we do, it's a lot easier to feel included, understood, and seen. So in other words, it's easier for us to feel loved around people who are like us. Miles McPherson talks about this phenomenon in his book, The Third Option, through what he calls in-group and out-group bias. So for example, as someone who went to school for music, musicians would be one of my in-groups. I've got similar experiences and a knowledge base as those who play music. And even whenever I meet another musician for the first time, we can play together without having to work a lot out or explain much to one another. And even more specific than that, I also love listening to metal. So metalheads are one of my in-groups. So when I see someone that's wearing a band's t-shirt that I like, I instantly have this connection with them. But having an in-group naturally creates this out-group bias. So if I meet someone and they're wearing a metal band shirt that I like, I wanna talk about it to them, but my wife, her eyes just instantly glaze over. She's not gonna to wanna to be a part of that conversation. She's outside of our metalhead in-group. So apply this principle politically, racially, socially, and you get the kind of divided society that we have today. McPherson goes on to say that following Jesus means that we need to resist this impulse and start to learn to bring others in and find our common value, even when on the surface it doesn't seem like you have that much in common. And Jesus says in Matthew 5, 46 and 47, if you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that. So we naturally sense that we're in with people who are like us. But the problem is when we confuse being comfortable with being loved. Choosing to go beyond our comforts and preferences are going to model the same kind of love that Jesus showed us. Another shallow love can come from what you do. Our accomplishments and achievements can man manufacture this sense 
that we are loved. Like we can think uh, that we can be the object of love, but only as long as we earn it. So maybe your parents only gave you affection if you got good enough grades or performed well enough in sports. And we can feel the same way with God. Like as long as I do good enough or be nice enough, God's going to accept me. Like as long as I manage my sin well enough, then Jesus will love me. But as we read last week, the truth of the matter in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 is that salvation is a gift from God. It's not a reward for the good things that we've done. So your greatest accomplishments don't do anything to move the needle on God's love for you. He gives it to you because of who he is, not because of what you do. So shallow loves leave us wanting more, but when we experience the kind of love that Paul is describing in this prayer, God's love fills us until it overflows out of us. And these verses describe a few ways that that happens. So God's overflowing love is one that strengthens. Look at verse 16. I pray that from his glorious unlimited resources, he will empower you with inner strength through his spirit. This verse is one of many that tells us that when God's spirit comes upon us, it brings power. God's love strengthens and empowers. God especially seems to like empowering those who society deems to be too small or too weak. Jesus empowered those who were looked down on by religious leaders by telling them that their sins were forgiven. God empowered women who were not valued in a patriarchal Roman society to be the first preachers of the gospel after Jesus resurrected. Holy Spirit empowered this ragtag crew of uneducated blue-collar workers to establish God's kingdom after Jesus ascended. Paul is blown away that God would empower him, of all people, to bring the gospel to the Gentiles. In Ephesians 3.8, he writes, Though I am the least deserving of all God's people, he graciously gave me the privilege of get telling the Gentiles about the endless treasures available to them in Christ. So many of us might feel like Paul and think that there is no way that God could use us. Like we feel too young, too old, too uneducated, too imperfect. In other words, we feel too weak. But 2 Corinthians 12, 9, God says, my power is made perfect in weakness. And so God has this affinity for empowering the weak, empowering the humble and giving strength to the meek. So if you feel too small to be used by God, you are in the right place. God's love wants to strengthen you. So God's overflowing love is one that strengthens. It's also a love that sticks around. Verse 17 says, Then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust him. Your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. So being filled with God's love means that he comes to live inside of us. God's spirit has made his home inside of us, the church. Like we are God's permanent address. He's not going anywhere. Jews and Gentiles lived this out in their day because they had experienced this reality about God. Jews had this in-group bias with other Jews, which meant that the Gentiles were out and the same was true in reverse. So when you were Jewish, you got used to being uh, things being a certain way. You followed the laws of Moses. You practiced Jewish traditions like eating certain foods and circumcision, but Gentiles didn't do any of that stuff. But when they both decided to follow Jesus, it meant that they knew they needed to learn how to live together. And so disputes would break out in the church as they tried to figure out what following Jesus should look like. And I would imagine some of their conversations got pretty heated, you know, and awkward at times too. Because just think of someone who's Jewish asking a Gentile if they're willing to be circum uh, circumcised. Like, that is an awkward conversation to have. 
But Paul writes in Ephesians 3, 6, this is God's plan. Both Gentiles and Jews who believe the good news share equally in the riches inherited by God's children. Both are part of the same body and both enjoy the promise of blessings because they belong to Christ Jesus. So that despite their differences, they decided that they were better together than apart. God was calling them to live as one body and they had to stick together. So when we experience the stickiness of God's love, a love that lives with us, it's easier for us to persevere in relationships with others, no matter how far that gap might seem. I'll admit, it can be hard to want to be around someone who's unlike me, let alone stick around them. And this is one of the ways that we've reached the kind of divisive climate that we have today in our country, because right now we've got two halves of a country that are ready to disown the other half. But God wants the church to resist that impulse. It's easy to stick with those who think like me, and and it's easy for me to assume the worst of those who aren't in my ideological in-group. But what if we were known in our circles as people who have this uncompromising commitment to the people in our life and and the people in our church family, no matter how different they might seem from me? Like, how charitable are you to those who have perspectives that are different from your own? Like, how can we as Christians become open to living life with people of different ages, different income statuses, different races and perspectives, both within and outside of the church. Because Jesus wants us to follow his lead and bring those who are out to the inside by living a love that sticks around. Lastly, God's overwhelming love is one that stretches. Verse 18 And may you have the power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, and how deep his love is. This verse describes an omnidirectional love that God gives us. Like there is nowhere that you are that God's love isn't. God didn't wait for us to get our stuff together. In Jesus, we see God's love stretching and pursuing us. He wants to bring us in. He met us where we were. Like His love chases us. It grows around us even when we're prone to wander or choose to be selfish instead of reciprocating his love. In Jesus, we see that God chooses us and he accommodates to where we are. One of the ways that I have been able to experience a love that stretches around me no matter what is through my parents. And when I was little, they fed me, they clothed me, and consoled me as a baby no matter how tired they felt or how much they didn't really want to stay up with me in that moment. And later when I was a teenager, they let me blast terrible punk music even when they didn't want to hear it. And when I dyed my hair orange in high school, I said, hey, dad, what do you think of my hair? And he said, I don't love the hair, but I sure love you. Later during college, I started to make some decisions that were really painful for my parents to deal with. But I saw their love stretch and grow around me no matter how uncomfortable my life made them. They accepted me no matter what. So when I was avoiding them, they kept inviting me to family get-togethers. When I ignored their calls, they let me know that I was always welcome with them. So their actions made it clear. Their love had no limits. Their love would stretch to meet me where I was. So as we close today in worship, I would invite us to just ask God to fill you with his love. His love wants to be rooted in you and overflow to the people around you. Let's pray. God, we need more of you. We need more of your love. Only your love can fuel us to the life that you're calling us to. 
Would you just come and fill us in these moments as we worship? We'd love to pray for you. Perhaps you want someone just to pray with you for God's love and power to fill you today. So message us on Facebook or live chat with us on our website, and one of our online prayer partners will be there to pray for you. But as you go, you are being sent with God's love and power. May it flow out of you.